Y de Santa. Um, ¿Sube? ¿Es it working now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so I'm going to be presenting some joint work with Phil Ponocchio, who is also at this conference. And what we did is we formalized the definition of local field and some of the uh, basic theorems about local fields in the theorem prover Lean. So uh, if you haven't heard this uh, local field uh, definition before, this is kind of master's level number theory. Uh, I do not expect you to know about these results uh, for today's talk. I will be introducing everything. And we formalized this project using about 8,000 lines of Lean 3 code. Um, we used Lean 3 because it was the standard when we started our project. Uh, however, uh, now the community has moved on to using Lean 4, which means that uh, we have to port everything to Lean 4 because we want the community to be able to use our work. And I also want to mention that in this work, we needed to combine results from different areas of mathematics. So we needed uh, algebraic, analytic, topological results. So for us, it was very helpful that everything is integrated in the same library, MathLib, and everything worked very well together. Okay, so I will start a talk with some motivation as to what are local fields, how they show up naturally in number theory problems. And for that, I will start by looking at some examples. So this is a very typical example of like classical number theory. We want to find all of the integral solutions to a, a, a Diophantine equation, so an equation like x squared plus, plus y squared plus z squared is equal to zero. And in this case, uh, well, we can clearly see that there is only one solution, which is the solution where all of the coordinates are equal to zero. And the way we see this is that, well, if x, y, and z are real numbers, then the squares of these numbers are always going to be non-negative. So the only way that three uh, non-negative real numbers add up to zero is if all of these numbers are equal to zero from, from the beginning, uh, which means that there is only one solution with uh, real coordinates. And this solution is the unique solution with integer coordinates. Now, if we look at a slightly different example, uh, again, we want to find all of the integral solutions to now to the equations x squared plus y y squared minus three z squared is equal to zero. Now, um, we can try to start the same way. So we can try to start by reasoning with real numbers. But in this case, a positivity argument is not going to work because of this minus that we have in the formula, right? And in, in fact, it turns out that this uh, equation has real solutions. I've written some of the solutions here on the screen, but in fact, it has infinitely many solutions, right? So we cannot do as before. Before we, we said, okay, there's only one real solution. It happens that this solution is, is integral, so the, therefore there is only one integral solution. But here we have many real solutions. And so far we have not discarded the possibility that one of these solutions might be an, in, an integral solution or many of these solutions may be integral solutions. So instead, what we are going to do is we are going to look at this uh, equation instead of thinking of it as an equation with integral coordinates, we are going to think of it as an equation with uh, coordinates in set mod three. So that means that uh, there's only three values, zero, one, and two, and uh, for each of the coordinates, x, y, and z, which means that this is now a finite problem, right? So I can plug in all of the possible values for each of the coordinates, and by doing that, doing this case analysis, we see that the only solution uh, modulo three is the solution where all of the coordinates are equal to zero. In terms of integral numbers, what this tells me is that for every solution to this equation, all of the coordinates are divisible by three, right? And then um, if we look at how many times three divides different parts of this, this equation, we will conclude that the only possibility is again that <coughs> x, y and, y and z are all equal to zero. So again, there is only the trivial solution in the integers to this equation. Okay, so in this case, working in the reals didn't help, but working modulo a prime didn't, did help and allow us to conclude that there is only one solution. Okay, for the last example, I now want to consider uh, the case of the equation x squared plus y, z, y squared is equal to z squared. And I want to assume that ABC is a solution, an integral solution to this equation. And I want to prove that in that case, ABC is going to be a multiple of four. Well, um, 
the real numbers again are not going to help with this problem because this is now a divisibility problem, right? So we have to find somewhere else to work. Since there is a four here in the statement, maybe the correct prime to use will be two. Um, if we try to work mod two, that's not going to give us enough, enough information. And maybe you think, okay, that is fair because there is a four in the statement of the, the theorem. There may be also a four in the proof of the theorem. But it turns out that even if we try to do a case analysis working modulo four, this doesn't work because we are only able to conclude that um, ABC is a multiple of two, but we are not able to conclude that this is a multiple of four. However, if we go to a bigger ring, so if we consider solutions not modulo four, but modulo eight, in this case, by doing again a similar case analysis, we can see um, that it is true that uh, ABC has to be a multiple of four. The upshot of this example is that sometimes working modulo a prime pre is not enough for what we want to prove. And sometimes we need to consider higher powers, p square, p cube, p to the four, or whatever. But even then, it is not always true for more complicated problems that working modulo a finite uh, power of p is enough. Sometimes we have to consider all of the possible powers of p at the same time. And we can do that using a field uh, called the periodic numbers. So the periodic numbers is going to give us a better analog to the real numbers because uh, both of these fields are constructed with a very similar construction. So to construct the real numbers, what we do is we start with the uh, field Q of rational numbers. On Q, we have the usual Euclidean absolute value. And if we complete Q with respect to this absolute value, that is, we throw in all of the uh, limits of Cauchy sequences and we take some equivalences, then uh, we, are cons we, we have constructed the real numbers. However, the usual absolute value is not the only interesting absolute value on Q. In fact, it turns out that for every prime P, we have a periodic absolute value. And we'll see the definition later, but for now, just keep in mind that in this absolute value, P is small. So P to the N goes to zero when N goes to infinity. And again, we can complete Q with respect to this uh, absolute value, this periodic absolute value. And the field that we get in this case is called QP, the periodic numbers. QP is the first example of what we call a local field. Okay. So it turns out that there are only two kinds of local fields, which can be mixed characteristic and equal characteristic, and they are going to be generalizations of this construction of QP. So the first case is a mixed characteristic local field. This is just a finite field extension of the field QP of periodic numbers for some prime P. <coughs> this is uh, how we code this in Lean. It's very straightforward. We fix a prime P. We have a field K, which is an extension um, of QP, which is represented by this algebra QP K. And then we are just asking that this extension is finite. The second kind of local field is called equal characteristic local field. The definition is very similar, but now instead of considering finite field extensions of QP, we consider finite field extensions of the field FPX of Laurent series over FP for some prime P. Okay. Now, uh, there is th this, these two definitions are very concrete. We are just defining finite extensions of some field. But there's also a more abstract, if you will, definition that encompasses these two ones. So uh, we can say that a local field is a field which is complete with respect to a discrete valuation and which finite residue field. Uh, all of these terms are in red right now because I haven't explained them yet. I'm going to explain them now. But before doing that, I want to say that we formalize this definition in Lean and we prove that uh, the two previous definitions, mixed characteristic and equal characteristic local fields, are particular cases of this definition. And therefore, uh, since these two uh, kinds of local fields share many theorems that are true about both of them, um, having this more abstract definition that uh, includes these two cases means that we can prove theorems for the more uh, general definition. And then this means that we don't have to duplicate all of the theorems and duplicate all of the proofs for each of these cases. Okay, so uh, now I will start telling you what I mean by discrete valuation. So first, 
I will define what evaluation is. So evaluation V on a ring R, this is just a map from R that satisfies some properties. So I want the evaluation of zero to be zero, the evaluation of one is equal to one. I want that V is a multiplicative function. And I also want that the evaluation of the sum is less than or equal to the sum, to, sorry, to the maximum of the evaluations. Okay, uh, the codomain of this function, which I am denot denoting gamma not zero, could be something relatively complicated, but for the purposes of this talk, you can assume that this codomain is going to be the non-negative real numbers or some nice subset of the non-negative real numbers. Okay, uh, if you do that simplification, then uh, these axioms look very similar to the axioms for defining an absolute value, right? The, the difference is in the last one, because in the usual definition of absolute value, we will have that the valuation of the sum is less than or equal to the sum of the valuations, right? Here we have something stronger. We have that it is less than or equal to the maximum, which means that this will be a, a special case of absolute value. Okay. Uh, for the first example, we are going to consider the periodic uh, numbers. We are going to see what is the valuation that we, or the absolute value that is used in the definition of the periodic numbers. So we start with the ring R of integer numbers and some prime number P. We are first going to define a function which I am calling the additive periodic valuation, AP. And AP of a non-zero integer R is going to be the maximum power of P such that uh, P to the n divides R. Of course, if uh, we take the integer number zero, then every power of P is going to divide zero. So in that case, we will say that the additive periodic valuation of zero is equal to infinity. We can extend this function to a function on the rational numbers by saying that uh, the additive valuation of a fraction is uh, the additive valuation of the numerator minus the additive valuation of the denominator. Some examples, uh, if we look at the three addict valuation of 18, that will be equal to two because three goes twice into 18. Or if we consider the fraction five over 16, the two addict valuation will be equal to negative four because we have two to the four in the denominator. Okay, but this is not quite what we wanted because this function, this additive valuation does not satisfy the axioms in the previous slide but we can use it to construct a function that does. And the way we do that is uh, we define a function from Q to uh, the set of integral powers of P union zero, which is given by sending the uh, rational number X to P raised to the negative of the additive valuation. Now we can check that this uh, new function VP, which is called the periodic valuation on Q, does satisfy all of the axioms in the previous slide. One impl implementation note here is that uh, when we formalize this in Lean, we don't want to work with P to the set union zero uh, because this involves some choices that we, won't, we don't want to do. Instead, we work some, with some abstraction. So uh, we use a type which I am denoting set M zero here. And to construct this type, we first take multiplicative set. Multiplicative set will be a way of representing P to the set but we have without having to choose the base p here. And then to that multiplicative version of the integers, we add the element zero. Okay. Now in this talk, we will be especially interested in discrete valuations. And a discrete valuation is going to be a valuation on a field k, where the codomain is this type set m zero, and such the valuation is a surjective map. Um, the formalization is just one line saying that this uh, function is subjective. And some examples will be the periodic valuation on Q and also the exadic valuation on uh, the field of rational, rational functions over FQ. Okay, so now I've already told you part of the, the um, terms that go into this definition of local field. I've told you what a discrete valuation is. Now, if we have a discrete valuation on a field K, that is going to induce a topology on K. And uh, we can see that K is complete with respect to this topology. That means that Cauchy sequences converge with respect to this topology. So all that is left is to explain what I mean by residue field of uh, K. And then we'll just say that this residue field is finite. So for that, I need to introduce the definition of the unit ball. Whenever we have a valuation on a ring, 
uh, the unit ball is going to consist on all of the elements of the ring that have valuation less than or equal to one. So for example, if we consider the periodic valuation on Q, well, um, an element is going to have periodic valuation less than or equal to one, if and only if um, P does not divide the denominator of the fraction, assuming that the fraction is already in reduced form. Similarly, if we consider the periodic valuation now on QP instead of on Q, uh, this set that we get is, uh, co is called the ring of periodic integers. That will be the unit ball of QP. Or if we consider uh, the unit ball of the field of Laurent series over FQ, that is going to coincide with uh, the ring of power series over FQ. Okay. Now, there is a notion in commutative algebra of a discrete valuation ring. So I've put the definition here, but if you have not seen this definition before, for this talk, I just want you to keep in mind that this is a special kind of ring. And I want you to notice that to define a discrete valuation ring, I am not using a discrete valuation anywhere. So all of the properties that I, I'm using in this, defini in this definition are properties that I can define without having to refer to a discrete valuation. However, it is very clear that if we have a notion of discrete valuation and we have a different notion called discrete valuation ring, there should be some kind of relation between the two, right? And uh, this is true. Uh, it is well known mathematically, but it had not been formalized before. So we formalize uh, two theorems going in both directions. So first, um, we formalize that if K is a field with a discrete valuation V, then the unit ball of K is a discrete valuation ring. Okay, uh, one property that discrete valuation rings have is that they have a unique maximal ideal. In the case that uh, we start with a discrete valuation on a field K and we consider the discrete valuation ring K0 equal to the unit ball of K, then the maximal ideal is going to be given by uh, the elements of the field which have valuation strictly less than one. So for example, in the case of the periodic valuation on, uh, on the periodic integer set P, the maximal ideal is generated by the element P. And um, in the case of um, the exotic valuation on FQX is again generated by uh, the element X. More generally, we have that um, the maximal ideal of the unit ball is always going to be generated by a single element which has some special properties. We also have a theorem going the other way. So the other theorem is that if we start with a discrete valuation ring A, then we can look at the fraction field of A. That means the field uh, where the elements are fractions uh, of elements of, of A, where the denominator is non-zero. Then we can put a discrete valuation on this fraction field. And this uh, discrete valuation is induced by the unique maximal ideal on the discrete valuation ring. Okay, so now we have everything that we needed for the definition because uh, we have defined the unit ball and its maximal ideal. And then the residue field is just defined as the quotient of the unit ball K0 by the maximal ideal of the valuation. So the last condition that we need is we need to say that this residue field is finite. Okay, so this is the, the definition in Lean. Um, a local field is a field with a valuation, so this is represented by this um, valued get set M0. And then we have the three properties that the field is complete with respect to the topology induced by this valuation, that the valuation is discrete, and that the residue field is finite. Okay. We, well, um, many of the results about local fields are also true without this hypothesis that uh, the residue field uh, is finite. So when possible, we always formalize the results in that level of generality so that they apply to other fields of mathematics. Um, some of the results, all of the results that I stated up until now also didn't use this hypothesis that the field is complete, complete but the next two results uh, do use this hypothesis. So first, uh, this is a result about extensions of valuations. So this says that if we start with a field K, which is complete with respect to a discrete valuation, and we have some finite extension L over K, then there is a unique discrete valuation on the larger field L, which induces the valuation on the bottom field. 
And moreover, we know that L is complete with respect to this new valuation. Very quickly, I will say that uh, the proof goes as follows. So first, I had proven in a previous project that you can define a unique valuation on L that extends the valuation on V, meaning that if X is an element of K, V of X is equal to this W prime of X. Uh, however, this uh, new valuation W prime doesn't have the desired codomain. The codomain is something bigger. So in this case, I put it as the non-negative uh, reals. We actually know what the codomain should be informally. Informally, it should be some uh, rational power of the set of the type, sorry, set M0. But of course, this doesn't type check. So even though this is uh, one argument that we make in pretty much one line in mathematics, we are just going to normalize the valuation by raising to the correct power. In the formalization, this uh, does take some effort because we have to be careful about uh, keeping everything in the correct type. Okay, and then the next results uh, that we prove about fields complete with respect to a discrete valuation is that if we look at the integral closure of the unit ball K0 inside the bigger field L, then that is actually equal uh, to the unit ball of the bigger field L. In particular, it is a discrete valuation ring. Now, I didn't put them here because of time, but we are able to specialize these results uh, to the case of local fields and get some more concrete answers in the case of mixed characteristic and equal characteristic local fields. Okay, so now I'll just say one word about future work. Uh, this project of formalizing local fields is the first step in a project to formalize local class field theory. Local class field theory is a branch of number theory where we want to understand the abelian extensions of a local field. So this uh, has many applications. It's in particular, it is using the proof of Fermat's last theorem. We can also see it as the first case of the Langlands conjectures, which are a big research program in today's number theory algebra geometry. And this is going to be a longer term project because it, the, the proof uses a lot of stuff. It uses ramification theory, several cohomology theories, class formation, and so on. So we are working on this, but this is going to be a longer project. Okay, if you want to see more details, everything is available online, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks for the talk. Uh, so if you have a question, please uh, stand up and use the microphone here. Um, thank, thank you for the talk. Do you have any kind of formalization insights or thing that you found particularly difficult or particularly nice in your in your formalizing uh, formalization experience that might uh, be interesting or useful for other formalization efforts? Um, well, yeah, we have several implementation comments in the paper. So one is uh, this thing that I briefly mentioned here, like this is a very easy argument on paper. It was not easy to formalize because we had to be very careful with keeping track of types. Um, what else? Um, we, I don't know how general this is, but something else is that we uh, use a different definition of the periodic numbers than the one that is currently in MATLAB. Um, the reason being that our definition fits better within the general frame, framework of adic valuations on dedicated domains, which was not available when the periodic numbers were formalized in MATLAB for the first time. Um, we did run into some um, inference loop in LIN3, but that has been fixed in LIN4, so hopefully it's not a problem anymore. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> And, and uh, on the on the second point, uh, do you so do you plan to change the massive definition of uh, of piadic uh, rings with with your new one, or like how do you like if you want to integrate your your, your work with massive, you'll have to do something there at some point, right? Right. Yeah. So the the current plan is to add a sort of piadic class, so that we can say that a ring is uh, one definition of the piadic numbers. And then the user doesn't have to worry about what concrete definition is underlying that, right? So that way the, the version that is already in MATLAB can't stay there because sometimes maybe it's like 
better for a specific computation or something, but then we can also have this definition, and hopefully all of the theorems can be proved for one version of the definition and then useful of, for all of the other versions. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> right, next one. Uh, please say your name at the free reaction. Um, hi, I'm uh, Kobe from uh, Delft uh, University in the Netherlands. Um, I had a question about your definition on the, I think, the uh, discrete valuation ring, that you define this as an integral domain, uh, yeah. where you say, um, yeah, but you use here that it's, uh, it's a local principal ideal, which is not a field. Uh, are you using here like a law of excluded middle in order to work with the negation, or... Is it, I mean, how do you formulate if, if it's not a field? Um, we just had an hypothesis, not this field. But this, is, this definition of this evaluation ring was not formalized in our project. This was already available in MATLIF. And in fact, there are several equivalent definitions of this evaluation ring. Uh, but yeah, in this case, not this field will be one of the um, fields of the uh, class this evaluation ring. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And then, yeah, maybe it's, uh, a little bit analogous, eh, but eh, you're also using um, well the, the field of real numbers. Um, uh -huh. I mean, eh, in the beginning also you, eh, you all say it's like the completion of uh, Q. Do you use, um, if you work with the real numbers, do you really use it as the completion of Q or is there, or do you well, use a Well, in this definition? project we did not really work with the real numbers. We only work with um, non-Archimedean local fields, so only with mm. the in the case of Q, we will only work with the completion with respect to a periodic absolute value. Okay. Um, yeah. okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, one more question. No one. And I thank the speaker again for this wonderful talk. <laughs>